Thank you, uh, Jeff. Thank you. I'd like to thank the meeting organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, four very brief comments before I start. First, um, in the program it says I work for Amerisource Bergen. That is not true. In fact, uh, I'm fairly certain that the folks that I work with and for at Aetna and the ones who, uh, oh boy, a musical accompaniment. Um, and the ones uh, that I used to work with at US Oncology would have a massive coronary if they thought I worked for Amerisource Bergen. Second of all, um, uh, Okay, good. <laughs> In full disclosure. Okay. Second of all, um, so I have some uh, content to impart, but I also realized I was invited because I'm entertaining a provocative. I'm okay with that. Um, when you're on the job uh, with that for the first, the first week, two weeks, you have a period of, uh, we'll call it indoctrination. They teach you things. One thing they teach you is to make it clear when you're expressing uh, something publicly to say whether it's your opinion or Aetna's opinion. Now, I have been tweeted about, uh, and I don't like it. So these are my opinions. Let's be crystal clear about that. Number three, I'd like to thank Jeff for putting Lee before me. I can't possibly say anything that could be as mean. And fourth, um, uh, fourth uh, as you leave today, as you leave today, you may remember nothing of what you hear except one thing, and that is a meprazole in your candy bowl. And that's okay. <laughs> and the reason it's okay is because it makes you think about what constitutes value. And that's what we need to think about. Now, this is a very vanilla title. Sorry about that. I won't disappoint. Um, I am an oncologist. My, my, my kids don't think I'm a doctor anymore. I swear to God I am. You are going to hear about healthcare from an oncologist perspective. Lee, please correct me if I say anything that is grossly incorrect. Why is there a problem a little bit on employer-funded health insurance, the impact of the ACA, patient contribution, compliance, new world challenges, and possible solutions? So I don't know where that slide you got came from, but when we looked at Aetna data, man, that cost is going up big time in cancer care, a lot. It did moderate over the last couple of years, but so did all healthcare spending. It's going up a lot, and trend especially is 20% year over year. So that's part of the problem. We're spending a lot of money. Peter, you get another click. Used to be drugs are 25%. Most recently I looked, it's 35%. And we have an image problem. So somebody said to me, oh, I hate this slide. If you don't die heart disease, you've got to die something. That is not a ringing endorsement of our success in oncology. All right? All right? Yes, we're doing better in... Breast cancer, I agree. We're also doing better on prostate cancer. Why? Because we've got PSA screening. Because we're treating people who don't need to be treated. All right, so all I'm saying is, still a lot of people dying of cancer. We made a, a dent. In some populations, we made a big dent. We still got a long way to go. And this is our fault, OK? Listen, guys, I know we think cancer is special. I, I don't want to offend anybody. But when I went to the health plan, some of the rudest awakenings I had was when I got on call on phone calls with, didn't, with people who didn't know anything about cancer. And we have lived in this black box for too long. We are special. We need to make the case for why we're special. What's different about it? People who have had experience understand it's different. We have not articulated that. And that's why we have this huge problem with value. Now, I don't want to insult anybody. Please. But when I joined the health plan, people th thought I knew this stuff and they were wrong. So I just want to ground everybody. To say insurance is like saying cancer. It isn't one thing. It's a lot of things. Medicare is one thing. But actually, Medicare isn't even one thing. So for Aetna and for United, most of our members come from large employer-sponsored um, pools. That is that United or Aetna, we manage the network. We credential people. We negotiate contracts. We write medical policy. We pay the bill. We do not bear the risk. For Aetna, it's about two-thirds. Self-insured. Self-insured. Fully insured are the people who buy the insurance themselves or work for small companies where Aetna or United bear the risk. The policies are comparable, but the Plan designs are not. 
We already commented on medical benefit versus pharmacy benefit. Medical benefit are things like going to the ER or infusional chemotherapy. Pharmacy benefit are drugs you get from the pharmacy. Why is that important? Because medical benefit tends to be paid on copayment. That is a flat number. Pharmacy benefit increasingly, and especially in the specialty space, is paid on coinsurance. That's a percent of the bill, all right? So, uh, as per the comments regarding infusional chemotherapy, you go to the office, you get chemotherapy, costs you 20 bucks. You go to the pharmacy with a prescription for Zytiga, and you have coinsurance, and you get $3,000 in your bill. Co-payment, coinsurance. And then high deductible plan, something that has entered into our vernacular recently and was commented upon this morning. You know, so you have insurance, you pay your premium every month, and you have to pay a certain amount out of pocket before the health plan or the self-employed sponsor starts to take some of that payment off your shoulder. High deductible plan just means that the deductible has started to rise, and that is now becoming more and more and more the case. I have high deductible plan in my insurance as an employee of Aetna. And of course, uh, all of the exchange plans are high deductible plans. Now, high is a relative term, right? Let's be clear about that. I'm going to talk mostly about oral drugs because I'm not going to talk about the medical benefit. I want to talk about the pharmacy benefit. First, I want to say that at this point in time, for the non-elderly, non-disabled population, employer-sponsored health care is still the rule, has been the rule, and a lot of people think it will continue to be the rule. This is an excellent article that I refer you to from Health Affairs last fall. You should read it. It tells you how employer-sponsored health care started to be, and it does some analysis about why it's going to continue to be. The bigger the company, the more likely they are to be self-insured. And what they're seeing is this. Premiums are growing. And they're shifting some of that over to the member. That's the world we live in. So who tells these guys, who tells the self-insured plans, what their cancer policy ought to be? Good question, right? The answer is you don't want to know the answer. So I'm going to call out Bob Carlson and NCCN, and uh, specifically this work's done by, by Liz Danielson. This is excellent work. What they've done, they've gone to the National Business Group on Health, which is a big organization of self-insured em employers, and they've said, listen, guys, this is why you should care about cancer, and this is how we would recommend that you deal with it. And this is excellent work. It's available online. Um, employers care. Now, cancer's not that common in the commercial population, right? Less than 1% commercial lives, as opposed to Medicare, which is uh, 3 to three to 5%, depending on who you believe. Um, but it is important. And, I, you know, I've sat in these meetings with these plan sponsors, and they really, really care. They do care about the cost of care, but they really, really care about the quality of care. They care for a lot of reasons, including the fact that the bills are high, but also because it's, it's a huge problem in terms of absenteeism, in terms of disability. So there are all these indirect costs that impact their ability to do business. Plus, they actually care about their employees. I swear to God, it's true. So what NCCN has done is they said, listen, this is what we think you ought to do. And they went through a whole checklist. And they actually did it in, in a series of steps. Uh, and they're still working on this stuff. But I really wanted to focus, I wanted to focus on the, the benefits plan. So they came out with a tool that the self-employed uh, purchaser of health care could use to look at their benefits. And I want to call your attention to this specific provision. Reasonable out-of-pocket thresholds should be established so that cost is not a barrier for patients to obtain their medicines. A max of $100 per script. Okay. I will tell you that NCCN has gone back with the National Business Group on Health and, and looked at the plans that were out there. And I've, although I'm not at liberty to share with you the specific data, I will tell you that the minority of plans 
the minority of plans didn't do that. It's just true. So, you know, we hear these cases, the case of the fighter pilot dude with the big Zelota expense, but they're anecdotes. We're talking about policy today. They're anecdotes. There should not be those anecdotes anymore, but they're anecdotes. And everything is different now. What happened before is before. And the reason what happened before is before is because of the ACA. So, you guys know what essential health benefits are. Pharmacy is an essential health benefit. Number two, there are strict regulations on formulary management. Some of them are written, and some of them have been learned the hard way. And number three, there's a max out of pocket. There's a max out of pocket. So the ACA for patients who are on the exchange plans and increasingly throughout the, the commercial spectrum will be protected from catastrophic cost. Now your catastrophe, my catastrophe, probably different. But, but they're capped at 6,000 plus per year. 6,000 plus per year. So prior to ACA, this is what the world looked like. You paid your premium every month. Some of it was you, some of it was your employer. You had your deductible, and then you had either your copay or your coinsurance. There was no max out of pocket. That means you paid that copay or coinsurance indefinitely. The deductible was variable, but I've told you it was trending towards high, and there was variable member responsibility. Post ACA, it's different because there's a family of personal max out of pocket. We do increasingly have high deductibles. And again, there's variable member responsibility. Okay, so if you're taking a meprazole, that means one thing. But if you're taking a matinib, it means something totally different. Because forget about the coinsurance. Forget about it. Because you get that first script and you have blown through your deductible and all of the all the stuff you're gonna have to pay. You blow them right through that. You gotta keep paying a premium, but you get that drug. You blow it away. Max out of pocket is reached immediately. Member responsibility is capped. Now, I'm not saying that that $6,000 don't mean nothing. It does. We've heard about how much Americans made. But the people in this room, people in this room, policymakers, 6,000 don't mean that much. The cost of the treatment then becomes the responsibility of society. So what? So I want to thank Nancy Keating for these slides. Very interesting study. It was mentioned briefly earlier, but I think you ought to read it if you haven't. What they looked at was the impact of out-of-pocket and health plan expenditures on uh, imatinib abuse and specifically discontinuation and non-adherence. And these are all privately insured patients. And they found that over time, there was some increase in the mean and median patient co-payments. What I want to point out to you is, look at what the median is. It's $40. That's the median. The reason the mean is so high is 6% of plans had that co-insurance design. The total expenses, of course, as you would predict, went through the roof because we've seen that the cost of the drug has gone up and up and up. So patients who had lower copayment had less discontinuation and better adherence. But the difference isn't as big as I would have thought. Now, I'm a dumb oncologist. But there's, this CML is an incredible drug. I mean, imatinib is an incredible drug, right? It is a drug, for those of us old enough to have treated CML prior to imatinib, it is a drug that revolutionized the treatment of the disease. Talk about a curative therapy. It is unbelievable. So why in heaven's name is the adherence that high with a median copay of $40? So the conclusion that Nancy drew with the TKIs are costly Small out-of-pocket expenses have a large effect on discontinuation. If we increase 
cost sharing, maybe it'll go down. I'm not sure that's true, but that was her conclusion. So we have a problem. We have an adherence problem, and we are shifting a lot of the blame on insurance design, and I'm telling you, it's a lot more complicated than that. And we are not, by any stretch of the imagination, out of the woods. So I'm going to tell you a couple of reasons why we're not out of the woods. This is the Illumina sequencing machine. I have one in my basement. Thank you very much. $10 million. I will sequence you for 1000 How's that for a deal? Gives you a lot of interesting information. I don't know how much of it is good, though. What is actionable and what actually makes a difference, I don't know either. I'd love to know the answer to that question. So we have the potential now where we will sequence a patient's um, tumor. And mind you, we are not likely to find an answer that is going to cure that patient. I know I've gotten in trouble for saying that, but I'm going to say it anyways. It's true. We might extend their life, and we may actually give them, as Lee has suggested, a drug that gives them misery for a few extra months of life, and certainly death. So that's a challenge. Here's another challenge. This is uh, the monthly cost of the oral drugs used to treat renal cell carcinoma. So if you talk to a doctor, or any doctors in here treat a lot of renal cell carcinoma? Okay, you talk to a doctor who treats renal cell carcinoma, they'll tell you they intend to use every single one of these, as long as the patient's alive. Okay, that, that's fine. I'll tell you, I treated a lot of renal cell carcinoma. And some of these drugs just never work if you use them third, fourth, or fifth. That's not hard to believe, right? It's just, that's the way cancer works. It's smart, figures things out. So we have no way of figuring out sequence. So we can just pile on. And then we got to get back to this price issue. So Mark Chris is a friend of mine. He's the head of lung cancer. At, uh, he has been the head of lung cancer with Sloan. He's got, now got another role. But uh, I showed this slide at a meeting recently. Mark really took me to task. But it's an interesting article. You should read it. So these are Canadian investigators. And what they did was they said, OK, let's see uh, whether we should test everybody for EM, EML4 ALK. And uh, let's do a little uh, quality business on this. Let's see what, how much benefit we get. And they actually gave, I think they gave Krizotinib, they gave the, the benefit of the doubt. They said, we'll give you seven months of survival advantage. Now, of course, it doesn't give you any months of survival advantage. What it gives you is seven months of progression-free survival. And they did all kinds of different levels of um, frequency of the mutation. And they found that as you think about cost effectiveness, there's only two things that matter, how much the drug costs and how good it is. Everything else just doesn't matter. And this is a very interesting slide, because uh, the nice lady from NICE is not out anymore, but their threshold for quality effectiveness is uh, 20,000 pounds, I believe. And uh, with their, all their new rules, it may be as high as 40,000 pounds, so let's say $60,000 or 5,000 a month. Notice that the price is actually not even on the slide because it's here. So it doesn't become cost effective until we reduce the cost to this ballpark. Now, there's a lot of criticism of the study, but I'm telling you, if we don't start thinking about stuff in this way, we're going to repeat we're going to repeat the proceedings of this meeting at a very frequent interval. I'm going to close with this. Um, Hagop Kintarjan from MD Anderson has uh, written and spoken uh, very eloquently on this, um, the subject of the, the cost of the treatment of CML. And um, this is extracted from the article he wrote, uh, CML is rare, but imatinib is amazing. We've got new drugs. They outperform imatinib in secondary endpoints, but not survival. Uh, and there are probably some patients who ought to get the newer drugs. When imatinib started, it was 30,000 a year. It is now 80,000 a year. And the new drugs are upwards of 100,000 a year. So that's just the, that's the landscape. Imatinib will be generic. Don't get fooled by capecitabine. It takes about a year. It takes about a year for the drug cost to go down. So don't worry that it's still too expensive. It'll come down. People think imatinib's cost will drop by 90%. That's a hypothesis. So this is the way CML therapy works today, post-ACA. Max out-of-pocket is reached in the first month. Deductible and coinsurance become irrelevant. 
member responsibility is capped, cost of treatment becomes society's responsibility. That's today. When imatinib goes generic, the cost of the drug will decrease. What if we took the drug off the specialty tier? What if we give the drug away for free? What if we gave it for a generic price? Deductible would not be met by the first fill, or maybe not even in the entire year. And there would be small or no member responsibility for the option. Now, you could still get the, you could still get the new ones, but you'd have more responsibility. You would be in the post-ACA world as it stands today. Just think about that for a second. I know Dr. Conti has an opinion about that. What if we lived in a world that looked like this? You get what you pay for. It works, you get paid a little bit more. It don't work, you don't get paid so much. Now, I'm not telling you I think that this is the way it's going to be, but I think it's the way it could be. <laughs> Thank you.